The case of Karen Reed, who allegedly killed her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe, is heating up again. I'm Lainey Law. And I'm attorney Andrew Myers. And we have Doug Cope with us here today. So for those of you who haven't seen our last video on the Karen Reed case, essentially Karen Reed went out with her husband. They had some drinks. She drops him off to go to the friend's house for a party. And hours later, she doesn't know where her husband is. She's making phone calls, asking people, have you seen him? Have you seen him? Nobody's seen him. And they go looking for him and she finds his body in the snow and she runs up she's trying to heat him up and he's pronounced dead a few hours later now the real part where everything kind of gets all crazy is that she is actually charged for second degree murder it is alleged that she backed up with her car hit him and then drove off now that's the story that we hear in mainstream media now a whole new situation is kind of picking up online where the, now there's this second theory is this a conspiracy theory that you know his friends at the police department actually were the ones that killed him and you know broke her taillight framed her to be in the position so that it looks like she did hit him and now there's all this internet drama stirred up we have a renegade reporter turtle boy which we'll talk a little bit about today and all of these other you know twists and turns in the case so uh hopefully that did the story justice i don't know what do you guys think well sure. yes but don't forget that they they were not married uh he was, uh, he was her boyfriend right uh, for one yeah. thing but uh this uh happened in canton massachusetts the town of canton and uh, since this occurred in January of uh, 2022, it has sparked a controversy throughout town because there is a general belief that uh, Karen Reed's, uh, the, the accusations against Karen Reed are part of a cover-up by uh, both state police and local police. Um, and she is being framed for her boyfriend's murder. Now, this came to a head uh, just very recently, uh, in in the form of a special town meeting in the town of Canton, which occurred at the Canton High School. And there were so many people who attended this town meeting that it had to be, uh, there were people spread out in various different rooms of the high school because there was an overflow crowd of more than 1,700 people. And if you've ever been to a town meeting in your local town, mm -hmm. which is unique to New England. You know, you talk about mm -hmm. town meetings to people who live in other parts of the country, they don't know what they're what you're talking right. about. Right. But it's it's the most direct form of democracy that exists in this country. And over 1700 people attended, usually in a town meeting, you're voting on the town budget, maybe some zoning things, and maybe you're going to give a raise to the fire chief. But in this case, uh, the special town meeting warrant did have a number of items. But there was one item that four hours worth of very heated discussion occurred. And that was a, a warrant item calling for an independent audit of the town's police department. Now, there was not any direct connection to the Karen Reed case in the warrant as concerning this question. But that was obviously the whole uh, inference uh, of the warrant article uh, that uh, the town's police department uh, has not been telling the entire truth about the Karen Reed case. There still are a lot of people uh, in the town of Canton who feel that this has all been a cover-up and Karen Reed is being framed. So there was a, a question on the warrant for A, for a vote of no confidence uh, in the police department. That question did not come up. Uh, but the question of whether or not there would be an independent did come up. And there was four hours worth of debate on this, both for and against. Some people saying there are already measures in place uh, that um, self-regulate, if you will, the actions of the police department. And other people saying, no, that's not enough. This is a uh, David versus Goliath issue 
where we're fighting a town institution. So the final vote was 903 to 800 to oh, wow. authorize uh, an independent audit. So what's going to happen now is that a five, and of course, this is kind of typical to town government, a five-member committee is now going to be formed. And by February 1st, this five-member committee is going to uh, begin the process to choose an investigation uh, firm, if you will, uh, to uh, take, do an audit. And I don't know exactly what the audit will entail, but you know, it's more than just looking at the finances on the books. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you. You know, usually I think of an audit. I think of yeah. you know somebody coming in and, and taking out the Excel or the paper well, spreadsheet you know, I, I or think whatever. In this case, well, also in Massachusetts, I don't know if you're familiar with it. The uh, the state auditor Diane Desoglio has been trying to uh, uh, do an audit of the House of Representatives and the State Senate. According to the Massachusetts Constitution, only the House and the Senate can make their own rules. And mm -hmm. the contention is from the attorney general that um, she, she doesn't have the power to audit the House of the Senate. So the point is, she wants to look at more th than just the books. She wants to look at how the House and Senate operate. And I think that's the intention in this case as well. They want to see how the police department operates. Now, also, um, as part of the vote, $200,000 from free cash <clears throat> for the from the town's budget is going to be used to at least start the process to find uh, an investigative firm to do this audit. Two hundred thousand uh, dollars for yes. an audit? Yeah, that well, seems like I an can, awful. That seems like an awful lot of money for an audit to me. Well, these days, you know, it's you know, you pay a lot of money when somebody does a job for you. Is so, it? Is it? You know, uh, is it the? Uh, concept here that by digging into the financial innards of the Canton Police Department that they will find something that um, that implicates them in this whole cover-up? Is well, that the whole perhaps, idea of it? Perhaps the case. I mean, you know, regardless of this, I mean, this case, I guess, was the crown, the, 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 the not the crown jewel, but the, the, um, the incident that I, I believe there have been some incidents over the years where people have doubted the, uh, I don't know, the sincerity and operation of their police department. Really? And this was the crowning blow. But again, the, the, the whole thing that I just find amazing is how much this case has completely disrupted um, the, the public quality of life, if you will, in the town of Canton. It is one of the only topics that's discussed anywhere. And, and again, I, I just wonder, can, this, can you find a jury, an impartial jury, uh, when this case goes to trial and the trial is set for uh, next March in 2024? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have talked about uh, this guy named Turtle Boy. Oh, boy, this, here we go. This, <laughs> this, this crusading, uh, yeah. self-serving... Uh, hide behind the First Amendment so-called journalist who has been, um, well, who has been accused of tampering with potential witnesses and is, and there's a gag order on him. Um, he has been stirring the pot so much over the last several months uh, about this case. So now, I understand that he was... Uh... I understand that he was actually uh, going to people's homes and, and outside of their homes, you yes. know, saying things with a bullhorn. Oh, he was um, going, he was going to soccer games where people's kids were playing at soccer games with bullhorns and, you know, uh, people who are, would be potential witnesses in this case were watching their kids play soccer. I mean, he was even doing that. So yeah, uh, I do want to say also for anybody watching right now, definitely remember with our videos, the intention is for you to never go out and find any of these people involved in cases. And we do want to, you know, remain firm in that it's good to have your doubts and it's good to want to know more about the case. But there's a difference in doing, you know, research and watching videos and writing to local politicians versus showing up at people's houses and chanting and 
going to games is horrible. So anybody watching that, we trust you guys to not do that. But this is your reminder. Please don't. Well, right. And the other thing is, is when I, you know, I, I'm the I'm the first person to say we've kind of lost journalism in this country. We don't have um, deep journalism. The, the newspapers have really downsized quite a bit. The Globe doesn't uh, own its building on Morrissey Drive anymore. The Herald doesn't own it. You know, they've really downsized what they do. And so one of my yeah. biggest concerns has been, as we've talked about before, where is journalism? But this ain't it. Going to uh, hockey games, football games, whatever, going to people's houses and yelling in a bullhorn. I don't remember ever hearing about that in a journalism class. Do you, Doug? No, and you taught no, the subject. And, and this uh, town, this uh, special town meeting uh, has generated a lot of media attention, as you might expect. So uh, even it, it's ginned up a lot more uh, attention to this case. And again, I, I don't see how you come up with a an impartial jury in Norfolk County. Um, I don't know. I don't think the prosecution would want to move for a change of venue. But uh, well, I was just going to say, isn't that there? Isn't that their remedy is to go for a change of venue? I mean, well, yeah. Would... I, I don't know if that will actually happen. The, the district attorney for Norfolk County, Mike Morrissey, uh, as we've discussed in a previous program, uh, even issued a video uh, before the case came right. to trial you know, urging people, please don't tamper with potential witnesses. You are, mm -hmm. you're affecting the, our ability to try this case and prosecute this case. So um, I, I, I'm just still amazed at, at how much this case has, has really gripped the people of the town of Canton and perfectly obvious in this special town meeting. I mean, you don't get, you don't get 1700 people to a town no. meeting and do four no. hours of debate on one question uh, and then, you know, move to audit your police department and people don't even know what that means. You know, what does an audit really mean? Well, I don't know what it means because I'm still confused. I always thought an audit was like, let's look at the books. How much do we spend for personnel? How much do we spend for budgets? Yeah. How much do we spend for paper clips? And I, I thought that's what an audit is. But apparently what you're telling us, and I'm learning this for the first time, folks, what you're telling me is that the audit goes much deeper than that and into what well, the activities well, are. Well, apparently it will. I mean, and that'll be up to that uh, five-member committee that is going to be appointed. Uh, and I'm not sure who appoints them. I assume it's the members of the select board there. Mm -hmm. But uh, there, there was also a, um, a warrant uh, article uh, for a vote on a no, no confidence vote in the town select board. But and didn't that, you say that did not go through? That, that didn't well, go? Well, it, it, it was not, uh, they did not, it was not debated. I believe it was debated. Do you, well, uh, just pretty what, much what just, did they talk about? Just, just this one warrant article. That I believe also uh, they conducted two votes. I believe there was a, a hand count vote, uh, and then I guess there was a move to disqualify that vote, and so another oh, vote uh, was conducted. Um, and I know, I guess in, in Canton, I've seen some pictures. That's one of those uh, towns where they, uh, I guess, they give you red and blue cards or something to to hand to uh, hold up. Oh, the okay. Vote. You know, in, in the town I live and all we do is we raise our hand, you know, and there are if it's not an obvious uh, majority or a unanimous vote, there are counters who come through different sections to count to raise your hand. But uh, during again, this whole just, town meeting vote, during this whole town meeting and I've been to town meetings and, you know, yeah. my my feeling is, you know, just move the question because, you know, people generally tend to go in with hardened opinions. People have uh, preconceived notions about what's going to happen. And if somebody doesn't agree with them, they're not even going to listen. They're just going to vote the way they vote. W weren't there people saying, you know, let's just move the question and get out of here? What, well, what were people I, saying? I'm sure, I'm sure in the, you know, in the end there were, and again, they debated this one question for about four hours. So um, I, I, I just, again, this is just uh I've, I've never seen so much public interest in a case of this nature prior to trial. No, um, no. you know, there's there's such a, a a large faction who believes Karen Reed is basically being framed for the murder of her boyfriend by corrupt uh, police officers.
Yeah, it just so, makes no sense. It makes no sense to me, but I, I just I, I'm still grappling with the fact that um, apparently they argued over the um, doing an audit. But did they actually get right into the Karen Reed case while they were arguing over it, or were they talking about the inner workings of the police department? Well, you know, I, I don't know about the uh, you know all of the debate that was done. Um, no doubt that the Karen Reed case was mentioned. Uh, again, it was not part of the written warrant, you know, for the reason for right. having, uh, and the reason why I got into a warrant, into the warrant at all, there is one woman in Canton uh, named Kathleen Howley, who apparently did a, uh, a, petition, a petition signature drive, and she got more than 300 people to sign petition signatures in order to get this question on the warrant. So, um, you know, she represents uh, the people in town who feel that uh, there is a cover up going on and she got enough people uh, to go along with it. I don't know if you've ever, I know you've been on different boards in your town. And at one point I was running for a position in this town and I had to go out and get uh, petition signatures, nomination signatures. Right. right. And, I don't know about you, but half the people I talked to weren't even registered to vote. So, right. you know, getting 300 signatures, uh, especially just in one town, not exactly an easy task. So this is something that, you know, was really was really worked on. And it does show the um, number of people who think they smell a rat in this case. Well let me shift gears a little bit. The last time we did a, a podcast on this subject, we talked a lot about Turtle Boy. And yes. um, he was doing those things, like you said before, he was going to the games and he was going to people's houses with a bullhorn. Um, now, he has been the subject of a, I don't want to call it a gag order, but he's been the subject of a gag order. What's happened with that? What's going on? Has that quieted him down at all? Well, uh, I, th I think to a point, yes in that he's been told he's got to stay away from any potential witnesses. Now, the only thing that has changed in that is that uh, uh, a Norfolk County Superior Court judge uh, is now allowing him to attend pretrial hearings, which are public in a in the public court of law. So if there are, and, and previously under the uh, order, under a previous order, he wasn't even allowed to do that. But uh, the judge did say, okay, you can go to pretrial hearings and sit in the audience like everybody else, but you still can't approach people, you know, and and try to sway them one way or another. You still got to stay away from potential witnesses in the case. But and generally, in my experience, in my experience, generally, there's a lot of decorum inside the courtroom, inside the courtroom before a judge even thinks about coming out. The bailiffs, plural, will give a little talk, you know, no displays of emotion, yes. no reading, no writing, no, you know, yeah. no listening to your uh, your uh, MP3s. Uh, make yes. sure your phones are off. And if anybody steps out of line, you're out they're of out. here. And they yeah. pretty much. Yeah, so there's a lot of order inside the courtroom. In my experience, 99.999% of the time. But in this case, there were huge demonstrations outside the building in Dedham at the yes. uh, Norfolk County Superior Court. I guess the other thing I wanted to point out was to people that are not familiar with Massachusetts. I mean, by now, everybody knows that we're in New England. But for people that are outside of New England, yeah, there's a lot of um, big uh, criminal cases going on right now. The Brian Koberger case out yes. in Idaho. There's the Delphi murder case, which is really blown up in Indiana, but with, uh, you know, with uh, uh, Richard Allen being bounced around, his attorneys being kicked off the case, the judge in the case kicking the attorneys off and then allegedly removing all of their filings from the um, docket. But yet the judge now filing uh, papers saying, oh, I didn't do it, it was the court clerk. So now that issue is, is blowing up in front of the um, Indiana Supreme Court. Uh, Alexander Murdoch has pleaded guilty to some financial crime. Now, all these huge cases are, that are happening elsewhere. This has been a big case here in the greater Boston yeah. area because Canton's, what, about 20 miles south of Boston? Yeah, roughly. Sure. And um, I've just, I, you know, I've been practicing law for more years than I really want to admit, and I've just never, ever seen this level of... Um, I don't want to call it controversy. I don't want to call it hate, but people are really stirred up about this. I mean, well, yeah, you know, I, that that is the unusual thing about this case in that it has sparked so much public demonstration of 
how people feel about not just the case itself, but the people prosecuting the case and their local and state police departments. Right. Uh, you know, and perhaps it's again, you know, part of a of a national trend in that people don't have the confidence in law enforcement agencies uh, that they once had. And that, yeah. you know, you have in a lot of large cities, you know, moves to defund the police and, um, you know, other moves uh, restricting uh, what they can do and, and not hiring uh, officers to replace those who have resigned or retired. Um, you know, I know in, in Boston, um, they are still trying to um, hire some some new police officers. But, you know, who wants to do that these days? Oh, no. Yeah, I definitely you know? agree with you where I think with this Karen Reed case and like we talked about the Koberger case as well, and even the Delphi case, I think that's a big reason. And especially because now with technology, the internet, social media, we see a lot of these cases where, or even like Kim Kardashian, for example, her whole thing is getting innocent people out of jail or people out of like small crimes out of jail. And I think especially now how we're seeing like the legalization of marijuana and people are getting out of jail for things like that. And I think that something nice about this generation and how the world is turning is that people are trying to be a little bit more empathetic and more questioning and less about the punishment. But at the same time, seeing that guilty people have been convicted of crimes and having that out there and then having all of these, all these details about different cases, it leads a lot of people to want to, you know, they don't trust the cops because it's been wrong in the past. Nobody's perfect. But now, especially with the past, I would say four years, especially like post COVID where you have demonstrations and then you have cops using excessive violence or uh, the George Floyd situation. And I think that in the past, you know, half a half a decade, I think a lot of stuff really has come out. And I think that's a big reason as to why people get so invested and feel so seriously about this because they themselves have had a negative experience with the cop or they know someone that's had a negative experience with the cop or they see a lot of terrible videos. And that's not to say, you know, all cops are bad. I have a cousin who I care very deeply about, obviously, who's a cop. And at the end of the day, police officers are just normal people like us. But I think that now there's a lot more concern with people going into these fields um, that they think that the whole purpose of going into these fields is for the opportunity to use violence. And a lot of people question if like for family cases, having different types of professionals, if we, that would be more effective. So with all these issues already pre-existing with this Karen Reed case, and you have situations like where, you know, we're not going to say one way or the other, it's up to the court to decide if she's guilty or not, but she's calling her friends, she's going to search, and then she goes and she's hugging and trying to heat up this, you know, body with her own body heat where it's very easy for people to put themselves in that position and be like, oh my God, like that's devastating. This is horrible. And all these other signs point to, you know, potentially other scenarios. So with the police being audited, you mentioned it's just like people don't really know, like we don't know what an audit really is, but people also aren't thinking about the financial logistics or like you say, like the five person team is just like, people just know that they don't like police officers. Let's go dig dive into this. And, you know, at the end of the day, whether they audit and find something with Karen Reed or they audit and find something else, I think to find something is going to help people. I think if they don't find anything, I think people are always going to be questioning the levels of corruption at the end of the day the universe, the government, and everything is such a large scale. I don't really think that nobody's perfect and humans do do bad things, but there's always going to be, I think, some level of distrust in the justice system and the policing system. I don't know. That's just my opinion. I think before it used to be a no, little bit easier to points. trust. All good points. Yeah. Doug, I have two questions for you. And that is, uh, yeah. 
what's the is there some kind of a time period that's attached to this audit or is it just going to go on forever is there well a I, that... uh well you know and that that is a good question because you know this audit if if they uh the committee is formed by february 1st and then they have to go through a process you know to choose the investigative firm and then when they do that whoever investigates i mean i gotta say they're going to take what six to nine months at least you know to uh investigate the department maybe more and can i say time, something this sounds like a typical government morass i mean there's no deadline they're not even going to do anything until february yes i know we're going into the holidays but i mean yes. you know people normal people not government people but normal people still work what well, you're telling me two hundred thousand dollars for an yeah. audit and there's no deadline this sounds like another typical massachusetts boondoggle where they're just going to well, spend I, I, money throw money down a rat hole and see that nothing happens much like the mbta which they now want 24 billion dollars yeah, to fix because yeah. well, that's, that's they've annoying. done it just sounds like another massachusetts i don't know why people have trust issues <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds like another mess two hundred thousand dollars for an audit they haven't even picked the company they're going to get around to it in february i'll guarantee you I'll guarantee you that it won't be done for a long time and they'll come back for more money. Well, that could very well be, <laughs> you know, and of course, uh, <laughs> one is going to assume that this case will be tried uh, and completed right. you know, before that investigation right. is completed. So, right. um, you know, so no deadline, no, no deadline. Well, at least not now. I mean, I, I think, you know, the town meeting vote basically is dumping everything in the lap of this committee that's supposed to, you know, come up with perhaps some parameters on, you know, what's to be done. And of course, the members of that committee have not yet been chosen either. You know, and you have, there's a process. You got to go through that. They got to be, they, I would assume they have to be approved by the uh, select board. And so you got to go before the select board, you know, and that takes time. And Yes, so the holidays are here. And, you know. So if there if there are, as Laney just pointed out, if there are trust issues with the police department, how in the name of everything that's good is a bunch of political people on a board of selectmen going to solve that problem where there's probably a lot of inter-family relationships between the two, business relationships, personal relationships? Yeah. How in the world? This just sounds like a mess that's not going to resolve anything. Well, you know, again, I mean, you know, once the investigation is complete, I, I guess the big question is, is it going to change anything? No. I mean, it's, you know. It's about making it, it look like you're doing something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who does it satisfy? So. Mm. I don't know. I, I, mean, I only have, I have one more question for you. Yes. As you know, I've only lived in New England for 50 years. <laughs> yes. Um, why do people say Norfolk? There's no R in the word. Isn't yes, there? I know it's Norfolk, and um, <laughs> but of course, yes, if you have the uh, an accent, uh, you often say Norfolk. Yes, I hear everybody say Norfolk, even I know. Uh, you know, uh, attorneys and judges and, you know, highly educated people. You know, sure. Well, I'm going to court tomorrow. Where are you going? I'm going over to Norfolk. It's like, there's no R. In yeah. R. Well, you know, I, as you know, I, as you know, the New England accent adds R's in some places and subtracts R's in other places. So, well, all right. I'm sorry that I've brought this conversation that, down to my level. That's how that works. Do you two have Delphi any? Delphi versus Delphi. Yeah, we said we, we got that wrong. Uh, one time I was watching TV. <laughs> I was watching TV with a friend of mine and we were laughing because it was somebody from Cape Cod, your backyard. Yes. And a police officer came on and said that everybody was working in the case, all the law enforcement. So <laughs> they, they put the R's where they sure, don't belong yes. and they, you know, yes. they can't say any. All right. I'm sorry. Well, my, closing my, thoughts? my father's accent was very similar to that. Yeah. But he was born in Boston. So there you go. Yeah. There you go. All right. Mm -hmm. Any closing thoughts, guys? Well, just Maybe. that. Again, this has been such a public case, even before it goes to trial. And it's too bad that it has really split uh, people in the town of Canton, whether you think Karen Reed actually did it or is the victim of a cover-up and a plot against her. And judging from the vote, the vote again was 903 to 800 uh, to... Um, 
conduct an audit of the police department, that's still a you know fairly close vote. I mean, it wasn't yeah. 1,600 to 100. It was 903 to 800. So there is a lot of people on each side. And sure. it has really become, sadly, a very divisive issue in the town of Canton and will no doubt continue to be. Well, I have a lot of faith in the jury system. I really do. Uh, and I think that what will have to happen is that they'll have to get jurors from other. It's a big county. Norfolk County uh, is a very big county in Massachusetts. So they'll just yes. have to get jurors from other uh, parts of the county out way outside of, of Canton and surrounding towns. Uh, but the other thing that I always like to point out is that the, the touchstone of a juror is that not that they're informed, but that they're impartial, impartial. and that sure. they don't necessarily have confirmation bias. In other words, I think she's guilty or no, I think she's not guilty. You want jurors that can remain open minded. And uh, now in Massachusetts, the courts do have an expanded voir dire. They've always done it in places like California and New York. When I started practicing in Massachusetts, they really didn't voir dire their um, juries. Now there's a pretty extensive voir dire uh, procedure in which, you know, uh, a lot of questions are asked. And when yep. you're sitting in the same room eye to eye with people, you can get a sense whether they're being forthright with you and what their veracity is. So I do have a lot of faith in the system and I do hope and wish that they will have a fair trial. And I'm sure I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. It's just that getting there and going through this process, unfortunately, has taken a lot of time. And there's yeah. been a lot of, you know, sideshows. Turtle boy. <laughs> and it's sad. It's sad. OK, well, guys, having, anything else? Having served, what? having done jury duty eight different times. Oh, good. Great. In the Commonwealth, <laughs> uh, and also uh, federal called for federal grand jury duty. Um, you know, it, the people who get onto juries, as you probably know, mm -hmm. are the ones who show up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Well, they don't want me in a jury. I've shown up a couple of times and I, I always call them in advance and say, you know, they don't want Mr. Myers, you have to show up. I'm an attorney. They don't want me on the jury. Right. Mr. Myers, well, you yeah. have to. So what I go, I show up. I went to federal Mr. court not that long ago in Concord, New Hampshire. Yeah. And um, I sat in the basement and they don't even feed you. They give you little bags of chips. <laughs> Josh, I never I never even got a bag of chips. So they, they called me up twice and other people were picked on those two. Then the third one, they called me up and I actually got in panel. I was in I was on the panel and they're all ready to start. And then the judge goes, he's looking down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, Come on over here. He says, uh, Mr. Myers, you're an attorney. I said, yes, I'm an attorney. He says, because um, I'd never been before him. He says, well, wouldn't you be more interested in watching this trial to see what the strategy is of the attorneys? Wouldn't you be paying more attention to how they're questioning the witnesses and the, you know, what their trial um, technique is? Wouldn't you be paying more attention to that than the actual facts? I said, oh, no, no, I'm not, absolutely not. I have an open mind. It was a drug case. I wanted to hear it. I, I was excited to sit on the jury. I'd already taken the entire day off. So I went back and I'm sitting in, in the I'm sitting in the jury box waiting for the thing to start. Both attorneys struck me. Yeah, yeah. They, oh, yeah. So I spent all day. This was at 3.30 in the afternoon. So, you know, no, I don't have the experience of being a juror. I'd, I'd love to be a juror, but, you know, I, well, they I don't was, want me. <laughs> I was I was picked three times to be wow. on a jury. And um, one of the times, that was in Brockton Superior, um, sitting down for a case in the jury box, Judge comes in and says, oh, this trial's been postponed. You can all go home. Uh, yeah. Another case, yeah. I think it was Hingham District Court. It was a drunk driver case. And, yeah, I'd, been, I'd sat down for that. And one of the lawyers said, nah, you out. <laughs> Why? Why were you out? So he didn't look uh, like be, Well, I was a reporter, you know. And, oh, yeah. <clears throat> and um, Reporters are reviled almost as much as attorneys. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but I was a foreman of a jury in Springfield. Yes, yes. I, I remember you telling me that, yeah. In a civil case. And that was pretty interesting, but we took care of that case in two days and it wasn't exactly a big deal. Now, but, I do know attorneys that have actually, uh, I, I know attorneys that have actually sat on juries and I won't tell any stories out of school, but I will say that it was really enlightening for the attorney in my office who came back and told us about the whole experience. It was really enlightening to know 
you know, how that happened. Because, again, when I was still living in Massachusetts, I had been called up to the Lowell District Court jury yeah. session. And yeah. so we're sitting in Lowell in the old courthouse, you know, and they, they wheel a TV and then the TV is telling you all about how important oh, it is yes. to be a juror. Yeah. Yep, they give you the whole spiel. So, yeah. So about you know about I don't know twenty minutes into that, the bailiff comes in and pulled the plug. He says, "You can all go in, go home. The only case we had going today settled." Yeah. So that, I, I've that had happened no, to me as well. Yeah. <laughs> I've had no experience um, as a juror, um, and you know when you impanel a jury as an attorney, it's it's quite interesting, and you hope for the best. I I do, I really do, and I mean it sincerely. I do have a lot of faith in the system. And I do think that in this case, to bring it back to uh, the Canton case, I, I have a lot of faith. I think they'll do a good job. I think that they will do, you know, the attorneys are certainly world-class attorneys and they will do a good job, you know, screening and finding people that don't have confirmation bias and finding people yeah. that can truly be impartial. Because I always say, you know, when people are always bad-mouthing the press, Doug, and saying, oh, there's too much publicity. You know, everybody's ca talking about Koberger and making horrible podcasts about him. How can he get a fair trial? That's not the issue. The issue isn't that there's a lot of information. The issue is whether people can be impartial. Right. So, and I think people can be. I really do. I have a lot of faith in it. All right, people, thank you very much. If you've enjoyed uh, this podcast, um, please like, subscribe, um, and share with all your friends and enemies. Anything else, Lainey? <laughs> No, I mean, you said it all perfectly. I think it's important to have trust in the judicial system. And like I mentioned before, you know, this is local news for us if you're in New England. So please, you know, be respectful. Write to your, you know, political members. If you so choose, go to your town meetings. All that stuff is very important and in being involved. But do not go to people's houses. Do not harass people. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. You have been watching About the Law, a production of the law offices of Andrew D. Myers in Methuen in the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts and in Derry, just outside of Manchester, New Hampshire. Remember to click the like and subscribe buttons down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to share it with your friends and others. If you'd like to talk to me about an injury case, a car accident, a slip and fall, a serious bodily injury case, or some other case, please feel free to contact me. I'd love to talk to you. You can contact us through my website at attorney-myers.com. We have a contact us block, or you can call on one of the telephone numbers we've given there. Or you can email me at andrew at attorney-myers.com. The foregoing is offered for informational purposes only. It is not intended as and does not constitute legal advice. Laws vary widely from state to state. You should rely only on the advice given to you during a personal consultation by a local attorney thoroughly familiar with state laws and the area of practice in which your concern lies. This podcast must be and hereby is labeled advertisement in some jurisdictions. Go there.